So, uh, the next talk is uh, Peter Reynoldson talking about uh, upgrading <laughs> a pre-configured CDD. Thank you very much. As you probably know by now, I'm involved in the Debian EDU project and we have been um, struggling a bit with uh, upgradability. I thought I just should do a well, informal talk about is the microphone before? I don't know. Yeah, it's working with it. Close. I have to be very close. Yeah. Uh, I'll be able to extend it up a bit. I think it's on. I think we'll go by. Okay. So uh, we have been struggling with uh, making a customized Debian distribution distribution for uh, some years now and discovered a few uh, problems. I wanted to share some of these uh, observations with the, the rest of the project, so we, hopefully we can improve the situation for both Debian EDU and all the other custom Debian distributions, and probably the rest of the user base in Debian as well. Uh, some people in Debian seem to believe that uh, Debian is uh, seamlessly upgradable and is working perfectly for all the users when they uh, want to upgrade Debian, it's no problem, they can do it for hundreds and thousands of machines with no issues at all, and all you need to do at the end of the upgrade is to uh, test it properly, and then it, it, then it is okay. I do not share this view. I'll um, go through what I mean with a seamless upgrade. I'll talk about some of the issues I've discovered with uh, upgrading packages with no local configuration, with user configuration, with server configuration. I'll run through a few proposed solutions and uh, then give a simple example of the um, implementation of the solutions on the uh, random picked packet. So, seamless upgrades. If I can install a packet, add configuration to it, and upgrade it while keep the con keeping the configuration without any interactive fuss, then it is a seamless upgrade. And the non-interactability is really important. If you want to upgrade 2,000 machines, you do not want to answer stupid debconf questions if you want to keep the old or the new file. You want to keep the old configuration and the package should be working as it was before the upgrade. If this is not the case, the, seam the upgrade is not seamless. And there are a few problems in Debian at the moment. And there used to be more problems, so we are improving, so it's not like everything is bad, let's just give up kind of talk. It's more like uh, we are not doing very well and we should improve and we are moving in the right direction. Please help us pull the, pull the boat in the, right, uh, in the right direction. To give you a simple example, this is uh, from an earlier run of the uh, testing upgrade script I made, uh, I guess, one and a half year ago. It uh, was a very simple script, made a change route, installed a packet, uh, fixed the uh, sources of list uh, entries and did the upgrade from Woody to such. And this is like the basic upgrade. If you install a packet, you don't touch its configuration files, and you upgrade it, this should work out of the box, no question asked, and everything should be working just like it was before the upgrade. <coughs> this was not the case if you installed XDVI. XDVI depended on TText base, and TText base seemed to be changing its own configuration files after installation and then get really confused when you try to upgrade it. <coughs> and if you run into these kind of questions for configuration you didn't change, and you have no idea if you should keep the old or the new one, just imagine, well, try to explain to your grandmother over the phone how she should fix the configuration to make sure it keeps working. And that's a good test for um, packet maintainers and software developers. If you could explain to your grandmother over the phone how to fix a problem, then your software is very good. If you can't, you are creating problems for the support uh, call centers all over the world. And in this case, I think the post, uh, the pre, -con the pre -inst, post inst scripts of the packet had generated this file, and they suddenly decided to make it a conf file, and the scripts didn't really handle upgrades very well, so ended up with this stupid, um, stupid error. 
and of course the installation and upgrade was running in non-interactive mode, so it was impossible to get information from the standard in, and the installation actually failed. So then you have the other issue with user configuration. This is when the um, packet has been installed, the user have run it in one version and done some configuration of it, and then you upgrade the packet and you want to keep your user configuration. The user configuration is stored in the user <coughs> directory, so the system administrator should stay away from it. And this doesn't really work very well. KDE is a random example because I use KDE a lot, and we use it as the, the default desktop in, uh, in Debian EDU. And uh, I also run it on uh, the laptop of my parents, which I remotely administrate over the net. And upgrading from Woody to Sarge on my parents' machine confused them quite a lot. The um, trusty old logout button, which they have been using all the time to um, leave the machine alone and uh, turn it off, was gone. When you moved from Woody to Sarge, the logout button and the lock screen button was missing. It didn't appear anymore on the K panel. So I had to explain them where to find it in the K menu and confused them a bit because there were some problems with translations as well. So, But um, moving buttons around actually confuses non-technically skilled people. This is really painful. Even worse was that the K panel, the um, list of applications uh, available as a button at the, end, at the lower part of the normal KD installation, they broke. Because the content of this panel was written in a configuration file in the user's home directory. And it was pointing to files in the user share somewhere, the desktop files of the Buddha installation. And these files changed name, were moved to some other location, or were just removed, and the K-panel button stopped working. I think of approximately 10 buttons, only two survived the upgrade. And then you have the problem with larger installations, where you have different versions of, um, of KDE, or almost any application, but let's pick KDE here. If you have half of, the, half of the machines upgraded to KDE 3, and the rest of them running KDE 2, and the user can log in to any of the machines, and they will, so they will move from a KDE installation version 2, to a version 3, and back to a version 2, and back to version 3, and KDE get really confused. It's kind of capable of handling upgrades sometimes. It will convert the configuration to newer, newer version for format. But it's very rarely capable of handling downgrades, where it's supposed to like know the future location of a file and patch configuration from there. This does not work at all. And a third problem I've seen, upgrading server configuration. There, at least, the system administrator can cope with the problems, but <coughs> when you have a lot of them, you don't really have the time to do it. Squid is my uh, randomly picked example. I will <coughs> run a more detailed example later on. In Debian EDU, we want to set a few um, values. We want to increase the maximum ob object size, because we use uh, Squid to proxy or cache uh, uh, Debian packages. Uh, we wanted to um, refresh the apt release packages file uh, a bit differently from the rest of the uh, files it is caching, and we want to add access to the local network. And we want to add six lines to the configuration file. And we would love this to survive configuration up, uh, package upgrades with no questions asked. We can do that because we have to modify the file in etc. And during upgrades, if the maintainer modifies the file, the default file, debconf or dpackage will ask, do you want to keep the old or the new file? And we don't really want to keep the old file, and we don't want to use the new file because we want to keep the old configuration and get all the new defaults. And that is not an option when you run dpacket and try to upgrade configuration. But I think um, this situation is like a merge if you have different branches. Uh, and in this is situation, you have a branch of your own configuration and the branch of the new uh, package version. And if you can't merge that easy, 
uh, somebody has to decide which part of the configurations should be included from which branch. Right, Thomas Lange from the Fire Project mentioned that, that this is a merge problem where you want to merge configuration from the old and new one. And that's absolutely correct. That's what you want to do. I've actually uh, written um, interactive merging uh, <coughs> patch for the TP. It's been uh, in the VTS for the last um, two and a half years. Mm. And uh, I think it's finally getting applied. Well, I will tell you later on, I don't think um, uh, merging the one configuration file is the correct option. I think that's a workaround for a bug in the configuration system of several pro yes, programs. So, um, one of the proposed solutions, how many of you know um, what a hidden depth conf question actually is? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Right. On the screen there is an example of how to implement a hidden depth conf question. Some people complain that oh, I don't want depth conf questions, there shouldn't be any more questions asked during installation, which is a valid argument, but it's not applicable to hidden depth conf questions. There is no questions asked to the user during installation. That's why it's hidden. And uh, some people claim that, no, I don't want to make it configurable uh, one size fits all. Well, that's obviously flawed because we want another configuration and we do exist, so someone else wants another configuration file. So please make it possible for us to do it in a sensible way. And a shared way, because all the um, custom Debian distros want to configure uh, several on the same package list. They, if we can do it one way with one packet, all the custom Debian distros will gain from this. So to uh, run through um, the example, you um, make a template. Uh, normally it's a good idea to document that it should not be translated, because the translators are very active in finding text to translate. <laughs> and if you don't tell them that they should stay away from this template, they will file a bug report asking, it to, asking you to make it translatable. So Are you really sure that they do not translate this text? Hmm? This, is, this template is for wrong and or they just translate your line of text? Well, it's not supposed to be translated at all. Because it is not marked uh, um, for, uh, with, a, with a, another score. Well, they will read the template file and find some text that is not translatable and complain. So you have to write explicitly that this is not supposed to be translated. It's not a bug that is not marked as a translatable text. So you have a template, it contains a template name and a type and a default, and you have a config script, and this is kind of the important part. Some people get it wrong, they need to check if there is an ex existing configuration and use that value instead of, instead of the depth value. You cannot trust the depth values between different runs of um, the configuration script, or the maintainer script as they call it in the Debian policy. So if there is a configuration file, you need to use the value in the configuration file. If there is no configuration file, that's when you use the hidden depth conf question and the preceding. So in Seredu shell script, if a config file exists, read the configuration and set the depth conf value to the current value of the configuration file. And then later on the postint script will run and it do similar things. If the configuration exists, uh, get the current value and um, then you will fetch the current value from the devconf da database as well. And if those two are not equal, then you are supposed to change the configuration file. So you update the configuration file and you're done. This makes it possible for me and all the other custom Debian distribution to enable this option which is completely hidden from normal installation uh, processes in a way that we can uh, I'll get the packet configured at the same time the way you want it. Of course, this is not solving the upgrade problem, it's solving the installation problem. But if you make sure you actually track and handle the configuration you set in the post -in script at during upgrades, you have also solved the upgrade problem. <coughs> so on to uh, the second proposed solution. Um, as I said, the goal is to keep local configuration during upgrades. And for this to work properly, it's very important to not change the configuration file format between up upgrades. 
or between versions. If you do, you need to convert the old format to the new format, and you will discover a lot of interesting problems in the process. So it's a lot easier if you don't change the format of the configura configuration file. And um, the easiest way to make this happen is to make sure that the site or host configuration is separate from the packet default configuration. And um, you also want to make sure you have more than two locations for the configuration because there are different uh, groups and people that want to have a say in the configuration of a packet. At the university we have the, um, well of course the packet author which get to have a say in the default configuration. Then you have the uh, local or the university Unix administrators group where I'm part of the group. We want to provide a good default configuration for the university. Then you have the local system administrators at the uh, different departments. They want to uh, do some minor overrides as well. And if you're really lucky, you have the um, machine owner that want to have a say in uh, the configuration of his machine as well. So if you read in configuration from all, from at least four different files and merge the result together, you will make all of us happy without making us like having to step on each other's toes to get the um, to get the configuration we want. And this is um, just one proposed example. A read configuration from user share through config, which is included in the packet. Then you have some site which is um, read as well. I'm providing site share through config. This is where um, the university global group would put their configuration. <coughs> and then you have etc foo config, which is where the uh, host administrator would put his config. If it's a user application, you probably want to have uh, user specific configuration configuration as well, which would be in the user's home directory dot foo config. And then in some applications you want to provide fixed overrides. Say the university administrators want to make sure that all the users of a given program is using the web proxy. There's a browser and you want them to use the proxy. So you specify this in the site share through config.fix, which would be the location for the university-wide configuration. Or maybe the um, the machine owner want them to use his proxy and this proxy will talk to the university proxy. So he would put an override in the etc through config.fixed. And then of course, in the very, very, very rare case, you want to have a fixed configuration on a, a packet-wide level. I don't, I can't imagine when that would be useful, but then you would put something in user share through config.fixed. And this makes sure we, um, all the groups that want to have a say in the configuration have their own file and they can put the overrides they want in their file and not uh, run into uh, conflicts with the other group's files. And to um, apply this to squid, if the squid packet or the squid program would read the default configuration from, for example, user share doc squid squid.conf, that's just a um, random example from the packet that seemed to be a default configuration. And then you would uh, look for the um, site etc squid.conf <coughs> file and read overrides from there and then finally etc squid squid.conf and get the host specific configuration. And the post in script could for example ask for some common useful values like the maximum object size or the subnet that is allowed to connect to the squid server and then add that to etc squid squid.com and make sure those values survive upgrades. And for those of us that need to provide a more complex configuration we could add a file, you know, one of our packages that put a file in site etc squid.com or some similar similar location. Um, of course, in Squid, there is a painful limitation of the file format. You cannot. Uh, there is only there is not a level of um, indirection when it's talking about subnets. So, for example, we want to make a Squid configuration that works across any installation where you can have a list of IP subnet mappings and 
only provide a symbolic name in this grid.conf file. So when you have to change a subnet of a Debian EDU installation, you only update one or two files instead of a, as it is at the moment where you have to update ten files and get everything correct. But that's a minor issue. So um, that was my talk, and I would like to have a discussion on how we can convince the rest of upstream to realize this is a good idea and hopefully uh, make sure all the Debian factors are upgradable in a proper fashion without requiring manual work to uh, keep things working. Any questions? Um, do you think that there are problems with config files where the ordering of the lines are important? I don't think I understand it better. For example, if you have an HTTP config, <coughs> then, uh, the, the ordering of the lines in the config files are very important. Uh, and for example, in enetd.conf, you can order the config files uh, whatever you want. And I think with with certain uh, with a certain config files, uh, how to keep track of, of, of a syntactically correct ordering of, of uh, the yeah, the Apache config file is a really good example of a configuration file that is not easily upgradable. I don't have any good proposals to uh, fix that because the ordering is so so fixed. Yeah. And if it wants to read several files, and you can't just include them at any location, so Apache configuration file is a bad configuration file for most for upgrades. <laughs> Just, just to ask, the, the Apache 2 configuration is uh, much more, uh, well, in tiny little pieces. It is better for your plan, or it is the same as before? You mean the Debian? Yeah, the, the Debian configuration. Right. The .d directories is yes. a step in the right direction, and if you're lucky with the format, you can uh, you can do complete multi-level configuration of the box. But if the format is very depending on ordering, and if you can't override some values if they are set already, and some they will override if they appear later in the file. I think that's the case with Apache, that sometimes the first value take effect, sometimes the later value take effect, and then it's different between different values. So it's, it's a very good example of how it should not be done. Uh, up there. Um, I believe that Apache is a good example of where you have the maintainer figure out how to, what should be configurable and what should not, and then uh, push him to make those things configurable that you need for the CDD, instead of trying to, uh, to, 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 to make upstream design it a better way, like try to convince Apache to, make it, to use another configuration structure. So I, you're talking about multi-level config, I, I believe that this is a situation where instead of trying to go by uh, Apache's way of doing it, then you should instead use the tools <coughs> that they provide in the package, in Debian package. The yeah, first that's proposed solution that you're talking about. about uh, should I repeat the question? No. Uh, it wasn't that much of a question. Right. He made the observation that in the Apache case, it's easier to provide overrides in Debian than to try to convince the Apache group to do it a better way, and I tend to agree that given the current state of affairs, it's the best of all the possible options we have to actually get something done. And of course, at the university, we have our own configuration file, which includes several files in the correct, or in several locations in the um, Apache configuration file, so you can actually provide hooks that way. And it, well, we hope it will work across our threads. We'll, we'll see. Yes? The features here of um, the post here are so um, complex and wide that I think uh, the only way to uh, get into the point where all of the upstream packages will work uh, that way is to have a, a library or two that would implement these features. Uh, they, they should have a, um, first of all, configuration file parsers, of course, and then support for multiple level <coughs> configuration files. I don't think it's uh, even possible to try and convince um, most of the upstream maintainers to 
change their code to uh, have even two levels of uh, configuration file loaders. It should be some library. Does anyone know uh, these kinds of libraries? Are there any good ones? I agree that it would be um, a lot more convenient for uh, developers if they could offload that problem to some library and get it right without having to figure out, figure out the solutions on their own every time. On the other hand, there are existing projects that do this the proper way. KDE is a very good example where you provide an uh, environment variable with a list of directories it's supposed to read configuration from. And in that case, we in Debian EDU a distribution, we just make a subdirectory and fill it with configuration and point KDE to it and it works flawlessly. So it's possible and it's not rocket science, it's been well known for probably like 20 years how to do this properly. Uh, but a lot of developers do not want or do not know how to do it and they don't really even realize the problem I think and they would really like a better way to to make it work with their packet. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we can hope to convince everyone for one to use one true configuration file format. And just getting um, upstream maintainers to modify their packet in a way they don't understand will take some time. On the other hand, I have had very good experience talking to uh, upstream developers, explaining the problem and why I want multi-level configuration and get them to change the packet in a way that keep it backward compatible with the current installation base and also work for us <coughs> with multi-level configuration. So it's not that hard, and it's not that many packages either. We have approximately a thousand packages in uh, Debian EU, and the files we actually, or the packages we actually need to configure is less than 20. So it's not a really horrible problem. Most packages, most programs do not have configuration. That's the lucky situation. There's very few packages we need to fix, but some of them are really hard. Um. I think it would be very good if there are some tools or a little framework for supporting the config.fixed file or several locations. Uh, for example, for a uh, simple configuration script that has shell syntax. And if such a framework or there, uh, if there is a tool where you can say uh, there are, here's a list of, of directories and please look for the configuration files and uh, we, we like also like to support the dot .fixed uh, configuration, that would be very nice. Even in the FI project, uh, we have currently the, the problem that, that people want to use different configuration directories or configuration files and now we, we have to, to add this, uh, this feature to, to it. Let me... Uh, this is a, a shell implementation of multi-level configuration in popularity contest. Um, yeah. This is the multi-level configuration part. But but the fixed. Uh, fun. Well, if I wanted a fixed setting, we could add another line. It doesn't make sense in this case, but. Um, or you would also only edit after yeah. And voila. That's multi level configuration. Okay. So, it's not very complex. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hard, but you have to realize there is a problem and know that this is how to fix it. Yeah, except, except that this is a bus script. Or actually a shell script. Uh, it's a shell script, yeah. Yes. So it's uh, much easier with this one than, say, a C program. Yes. And it's I guess that, uh, in fact, that uh, KDE programs work well. It's because, just because uh, they have libraries which are very coherent. I agree, yeah. And having a C library for C programs, and a Perl library for Perl programs, and yeah, Python library for Python. Well, for all languages, having some uh, recommended way to handle configuration files <coughs> and making this well known to all the developers of uh, free software will help a lot. But some of it isn't written yet, and this is just to show that it's not very hard to do if you have using a script language that handle includes. Yeah. What about uh, configuration where uh, the number of lines, for example, you have the ACL lines for your squid configuration. Um, can this 
be used with uh, preceding because sometimes you only want to add two ACL lines, sometimes you want to add 20 lines of ACL definitions. Can that be easily done with preceding? Well, I don't know about the easily part, but uh, I'm pretty sure it can be done with preceding, yes. In, because as far as I understand, the, the, the depth conf is always one question, no, one answer. No. You, can, you can register multiple answers to one question, so you can, you can precede it to one, one, zero, one, one, blah, 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 but it's sort of ugly. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect that in the complex case, it might be easier to have a depth answer to provide the other location of configuration files to read, and then we could just point squid to our file and be done with it. Yeah. So, but there is several ways to do it, and um, one some of them are more more easy to do for simple things, and some of them are more easy to do for more complex things. Did Did you uh, think about using CF Engine for these cases? We do use CF Engine for the cases, but that normally breaks up credibility because the packages do not really keep the configuration. So if you rewrite the config file, you end up with uh, uh, conf that config question during upgrade. And that's the one I want to avoid because when you as I maintain 1800 Unix machines, we don't want to answer yeah, 10 times 1800 is quite a lot of questions we need to answer. But, but I guess you have the same problem with Phi and, and massive upgrades as I asked you know, the question in your session that even though we have you know great systems like Phi to do mass deployment, you know, we still have to deal with this, you know, upgrade problem. And at the moment, even with Phi and or we have you know this upgrade problem seems to me on the short term to be unable to solve. Yeah, well, there is a uh, workaround being worked on in Spain. Uh, one of the custom Debian developers there is um, working on a kind of elegant hack where he would uh, just before the just after the package is installed, he will make a copy of the original configuration file and store it somewhere else. And then you can replace it with your file. But then I can replace it with my file. And then just before upgrades he will take away my file and put it somewhere else and put back the original file and upgrade the packet and then switch. <laughs> <coughs> so it, it kind of works, but it's not the most elegant solution I've seen to that problem. And uh, you have to keep track of the format to make sure it doesn't change and you will lose the, um, the new default values and all those kind of problems. So it's, it's a workaround that will solve some of the problems but not all of the problems. The workaround that we use as Phi users is wipe and reinstall for upgrades. <laughs> Which is a commonly used um, solution in the um, field of computer science, uh, but I would rather have an easier way to, for my grandmother to upgrade her server than to ask her to reinstall. Uh, I wonder if this, uh, because you, you mentioned what um, Sergio is doing in Spain, uh, what is the better solution for, for the problem? You, you told us about the problem, but well, we have no real solution for other problems, if I understand your talk right. We, uh, unless we get all upstream to do the right thing, we don't have any uh, okay. real solution so for all upstream is a, uh, is one part of the solution. Yeah, I think if you want to change the way configuration files in programs in Debian behave, we want upstream to be in on it. Because one thing is fixing it in Debian, one, another thing is to make sure the description and all the books explaining how to use a piece of software in the free world invalid. Because if you buy a book on Apache, you expect Apache configuration to work a certain way. And if it doesn't in Debian, a lot of people will be very surprised. So the way is, uh, at first, uh, take all world domination with Debian and make upstream uh, use Debian and so they will be careful in the No, I don't think that's re required. As I said, the, my experience with upstream is that they are uh, actually very skilled. They understand the problem when you explain it to them and they are willing to find a solution. So I've, I think for all four or five packages I've been able to get upstream to fix the uh, behavior of the, uh, of the program. But we have uh, more than 10,000 applications. Configuration. And we have a thousand developers, so if everyone knows about the problem and talk about talk with their upstream, we <laughs> have a fair few purposes. Yeah.
<laughs> Charles to fix it. Yeah. But, but uh, is it any problems with the use of you know that con consistently as well, or is that pretty much short now? What do you mean consistently? Yeah, throughout Debian. There seem to be an increasing number of developers in Debian that realize that DevConf is the best way to handle questions during installation time and make it so that these can be preceded. But there are of course some misconceptions about what DevConf actually is and how it works. And like the argument you shouldn't have hidden DevConf questions because the user shouldn't be com confused during installation. That's just a misunderstanding. And I hope to get rid of that misunderstanding sometime in the future, but there are still people that believe it. And there are also people that believe that um, one configuration file is perfect for everyone, so you shouldn't be able to provide the NTP server at install time. You should use the uh, NTP dot, the dot NTP dot org, uh, DNS name instead. And it will take a while before, before we can convince them otherwise. Would it be a good idea to, to implement something which makes it easier to uh, prepare hidden DevConf questions? Kind of template to make uh, developers aware that there is something like this. It's not really hard, but if, if it's something technical, well, uh, uh, a command line switch or whatever to, to, to enable people to make, make it easier to do Well, it's not that easy because it depends on the configuration file format. As you can say here, I've hidden the problem of reading yeah. the configuration and modifying sure, the configuration, sure, but for they are different. This template is always the same with, uh, with the exception of the name of the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the question. Well, the name, the type, and the default, actually. Yeah, okay. So the description can be the same, though it should have some information or relative to the relevant for the option that but is being enabled. It's just a political thing. I do not think that this is hard, but uh, just to make people aware there is something like this and you should use it. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can provide, we can provide examples and documentation and maybe a framework, but I'm not sure if we can provide like easily enabled hidden that construction because it depends on the configuration file format of the packet. And if it doesn't have multi-level configuration, they actually have to modify the file that was shipped in the packet and put in the right value and then it gets really ugly during upgrades. Well, I'm always thinking about if you make it technically very easy, people will use it. If not, they will ignore it because they are not reading this fan documentation. Yeah, uh, that is a good point. I, I just don't know how we could make it technically easy to fix. Oh, more technically easy to fix. Mm. You have a question or a comment? Was I mistaken? There, all right. Yes, um, I think here this is um, a good solution for uh, simple applications and simple applications. But um, for complex ones like Apache, it's uh, pretty much hopeless to uh, try and uh, solve the problem with Telcom. Uh, you can't make um, sensible Telcom uh, dialogues to uh, ask the user to, let's say, uh, specify uh, which virtual hosts or that kind of things he wants to use. It doesn't thoroughly uh, solve the problem, but it's certainly, certainly good to I tend to disagree. I think it's possible to provide that kind of preceding for Apache that will make it configure the way you want it. With, for example, which modules do you want to enable, or um, uh, what uh, virtual host name do you want to provide, and make sure that is going in some given include file at the Apache configuration will uh, read at the uh, appro appropriate location in the configuration file. I'm pretty sure that's possible to do and it would be a useful thing to do too. And Andreas and then over there. I sometimes wish there would be some web, web config question. Would you like to be user directory uh, accessible and would you like to have uh, the doc directory <coughs> accessible? So it's such basic things which you always have to change should be uh, in a low priority uh, web config question. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Yeah, I was just going to comment that yes, that kind of thing is probably possible, but whether it's wise to add all those questions to that point is another thing, because obviously those kind of questions are something that will confuse most users. 
Which brings me back to the misunderstanding mentioned earlier. You don't have to show these questions to yeah. the user. You only provide them to this custom Debian distros. So your objection is not valid. You don't have to present the question to the user. It might be completely invisible for all installations. Do you think that okay. uh, the um, custom Debian uh, installations um, uh, would be satisfied by the level of uh, configurability you could uh, achieve with uh, different questions? I think well, Apache is uh, something that you have to tweak every time. And uh, I'm not so sure it would be uh, quite enough. Well, based on my experience from the university, you don't have to tweak Apache configuration every time. The university provides uh, a default configuration that works for 90% of all the servers. I think they have like 100 web servers at the university. And the 10% will have add some extras, and just like 1% will replace the configuration file with their own because they have so complex needs. But uh, most of the uh, custom Debian distros will be happy with a small set of configuration options, and the rest maybe is happy to like take the path to a replace configuration file to be used instead of the default one. So I'm pretty sure it's possible to satisfy all the custom Debian distros with installation-wise, uh, installation time configuration. Yes? I think there was a question somewhere else. Or comment? Yeah. I would have a question. Um, you're, um, you're saying that the Debian developers should um, add the option for custom Debian distributions to configure the package more finely. The problem is, uh, without um, seeing it from the side of the Debian, uh, Debian distribution, I have no idea what options are really needed. I have a, quite a complex package and it's a lot of work to uh, support the options we have. So if you need more options, I would expect that the Debian, uh, the custom Debian distribution contacts the maintainer and says, I would need that option. And then we can surely implement it and perhaps it even as attached, that would, then it would be um, accepted right away and go in. So, check your business box tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's actually one from school at Linux. But um, I, uh, I asked back because it was uh, quite a complex patch, and I don't feel well and uh, supporting it without understanding it first, and that's actually the problem. It's a good point. It would be great if all the Debian developers could read minds and would like handpick the important ones from all the school Linux developers, but. Uh, I think we need to feed the information the other way around. We have to talk to the developers and let them know what we need. And also we need to talk to each other. All the custom Debian distros need to coordinate and see if they can, well, if they have common needs or if they are so different. Based on my experience, the needs are pretty identical. But I'm pretty sure there will be some differences between them. And yes, we should do a better job at talking with uh, the maintainer and with upstream and start a dialogue with each and every um, package maintainer we need to configure. Uh, but on the other hand, we do not have that many people capable of doing that, so we are trying, but we are not, we are not there yet, and we know it. Okay, but you were talking about 20 packages in this example, so if you try to get, talk to 20 maintainers, I don't think that would be a great problem. Well, you would be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> Sometimes we have been successful talking to the maintainer of a packet, got the configurability we needed to uh, configure a packet, and then a new maintainer took over and ripped the whole thing out. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. kind of painful. And uh, you normally have, well, we are all kind of busy doing everything, so we spend five, hour, uh, five minutes now and five minutes then, and when you need to talk with a maintainer for probably like six to six months to a year before they get it because you don't get to sit down with them and explain it to them. You get to send an email and then wait a while and you get an email back and you wait a while and you send an email and you wait a while and it takes forever. Yes. If you talk about the request, so okay. Well, there are technical solution and the social solution. And the social solution is that we invite every developer whose packages used by Skoda Linux to a party for a new year in Germany. So I want to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> we want you. Okay? Yeah, that's an idea that came up during uh, during DevConf now that uh, we should actually have sent you an email telling you that they need you, love you because we use your packet. And you are mostly well, really welcome to come to our anniversary party or release party or whatever and free beer 
review and then force you to listen to a talk about preceding and. <laughs> 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 Oh, we'll see. You get a ticket. You can only uh, cash in the ticket. For the, um, but we'll yeah, try to get make that happen. Yeah, so that's we'll a good see. idea. I will do it. I have a database. So, my question is, uh, if you go over to group maintenance, uh, do you think it would be possible from, from the uh, manpower point of view that uh, every interesting package for Scholar Linux is group maintained by any a uh, Scholar Linux developer, so you, you have a close the group onto the package. Well, that would be great, but I don't know, know if we have the manpower to uh, to do that. We we try, but still, it's not. Still I have a remark about them. Yeah. Uh, this is the last question. It's, it's like you don't need to have all packages maintained by Scholar Linux people. Also. We're yeah, talking about the problematic ones. Yeah. Only very few. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I interpret that to mean that for every uh, package which is group maintained, one of the members of the group is a. That, that, that's not what you meant. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, I'm not sure if that would scale, but it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a great part of being with all these people. That group. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's room enough. <laughs> okay, so I think we have to start. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>